Good morning, everyone. Uh, if we haven't met yet, my name is Pastor Jeremy. I'm one of the lead pastors here at Hope Community Church. They let me preach every now and then. So uh, if you would join me today in turning to Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Acts 9, 1 through 6. While you're turning there, it's my, um, it's my thinking, it's my inclination that in this room uh, there are many of us that have in some way, shape, or form in our lives currently or in the past or will in the future, we've decided to do things our own way, okay? We've decided to uh, go and and do things because it makes us feel good, that's the direction we need to go, that's the direction that we want to go, but we've decided to go our own way. And my hope and prayer is that today that your way and my way has a collision course with the way. And that those collision courses are going to alter not only just your future, but it'll alter the future of someone else and whoever God has planned. Because that certainly happened to this man we're about to read about, uh, Saul of Tarsus. So if you will stand, we're going to read the word of God together, and then we're going to uh, pray. Acts 9, verses 1 through 6. But Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and falling to the ground, He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise (laughs) and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Let's pray together. Father, I ask you again that you would grant me the spiritual heavenly gifts of preaching and teaching, of proclaiming your truth, of educating, inspiring, and equipping. God, because those are heavenly gifts that I do not possess, and God, I pray that you would grant them and that we would collectively receive them for your glory. God, I pray that today... That all of us would allow you to reveal to us ways in which we are going our own way. Perhaps the way that the world's taking us. And God, that you would just collide into us, God, with your way. The way of Jesus. You're the only way. And we thank you for that. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You guys can have a seat. I want to look at three things. I want to look at when his way collides with the way. That's Saul. I want to look at this guy and examine him because his way is certainly going to collide with it. I want to look at how the way is the way. So you got to say the way, it's, and it's how it you know, collides. It's gonna, there's going to be a collision with our way and the way. And then I want to look at how, you know what, how our ways Need to collide with the way. All right? Let's look at Saul first. This guy in Acts chapter 9, Saul, um, see, uh, uh, central figure, key figure to the New Testament and to the spreading of the gospel. In Acts chapter 9, let me bring you up to speed what's happened so far, okay? There was this guy named Jesus who claimed to be God, and a bunch of smart alecks killed him for it. <laughs> they plotted together, they got together, and they decided that he needed to die, they needed to shut him up, they needed to stop it, so they kill him on a cross, right? But he fooled their plans, and three days later, he did this thing called resurrect. He rose from the dead and fooled, or foiled their plans, and after Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to many people, his disciples, his apostles, those who were for him, those who, who were against him, we see that today, someone who was against him, he 
um, revealed himself to. He, he um, ate with um, um, the disciples. He was around, you know, 500 people saw him at one time at his resurrection. He's resurrected, and he is equipping his believers with the Holy Spirit to go continue to do what he had done and what he had taught. Luke tells us that in the first chapter of Acts, that all that Jesus began to do and teach, well, he's still doing that through the church, right? And it is growing, The gospel, the good news about Jesus and him being rose from the dead is growing. It's spreading, particularly in Jerusalem. It starts to spreading like wildfire. And then what happens is those who had him killed the first time decide, well, we have to keep stopping this. So they try to stop stop his, his disciples who are spreading it. So they arrest them and they say, don't you do this anymore, right? And they kind of give them a, you know, don't you do this. And the disciples, Peter and John, they say, look, whether it's for us to listen to you guys or to God... Um, that's not a decision. We're going to do what God tells us to do, and we're going to continue to tell people about Jesus. So, And they do, and the gospel, and believers keep coming. The church is multiplying. The numbers keep growing, and in, not only in Jerusalem, but it spreads. And we see in Acts chapter 8 um, in, in Jerusalem, a guy named Stephen, who was a new believer in Christ, but he was out there preaching and proclaiming. They arrest him, and it goes from we'll arrest you and tell you not to do it to we will beat you, and then now with Stephen, they kill him. They stone him in the streets. When they stone him in the streets, they bring their cloaks. It's kind of this thing that they did to to a guy named Saul. You encountered him in the last part there, and it says that he was approving of the stoning of Stephen. So that's our first introduction to him. But then we see because of Stephen's face glowing and him saying, keep throwing those rocks because I'm going to be with Jesus, that the church just continues to explode, right? And it goes outside Jerusalem into a southern area, Judea, and then into Samaria. And by now in chapter 9, the gospel has spread into the northern areas into a place called Damascus, which is where Saul was going. So this thing has exploded on them, and Saul is on his way to Damascus to try and stamp it out a little bit more, right? So I want, us to look, I want us to look at a little bit about Saul before we get into some of the his way colliding because it's interesting. Saul tells us a lot about himself in the New Testament because Saul's a prolific writer, right? He's got a lot of time on his hands when he's in prison, so he writes a bunch of epistles and helps us to have the Bible. But um, Paul, he writes prolifically, and in that he tells about his former life, and we get some indications about what he was. So First thing we see and we learn about Paul from him is that Paul was a well-educated man, but he was most likely wealthy and from a well-connected family. In Acts chapter 22, we find out that Saul, or Saul was a Roman citizen. I'm going to call him Saul and Paul the whole time, okay? I'm just going to go It's the same dude, Saul and Paul. I'm not crazy. It's the same guy, but I can't toggle them back in my head because I know he was Paul and Saul, so y'all deal with it, okay? Anyway, you think I could be more disciplined, but Saul... Okay, we find out he was, a well, he was a Roman citizen, which meant that he had to come from a wealthy family. Because if he grew up in Tarsus, that's outside the Italian peninsula. And for you to get Roman citizenship outside that area, you had to pay a lot of money. You had to do, there, there was some kind of gifting to the Roman government for him to gain his citizenship. So we know that. We also know that Saul was well educated. He writes this in Acts 22. I'll read this one for you. In Acts 22, he says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, Jerusalem, educated at the feet of of Gamaliel. Now, we know that Paul is he's extraordinarily educated. It was probably noticed in him as a young man that he had just this capacity um, for learning, but it was either when he was 7 or 14, his parents shipped him to the finest schools in the world to Jerusalem so that he could learn the Torah, he could learn what, what they had at that time, the Bible, and he could become an expert in the law and everything. So he's sent there, and they sent him to the finest teacher in the world at this time, a guy named Gamaliel, okay? And that's who Paul, that's his background. He was also extraordinarily religious. We find that he opens this up, that I am a Jew. But what had happened in, in Paul's studies, his religion had become about performing God's truth instead of just knowing God as much as he could. He, it became about performance, which was really true with the Old Testament, but Paul had fell into that. He is a believer, and he knows what the truth is, but the way to please God, the way to make God happy, is that you perform that truth out. 
And Saul says that he was the best of them all. In Philippians, he writes this of himself. He says, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. Meaning, he has reason for confidence in what he was doing in his body was going to really make God happy. And he says, if anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, of Hebrew of Hebrews concerning the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, I was persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. That's a pretty good, he, he, this guy was religious, wasn't he? This guy was saying, if anybody could say in what they did, please God, I'm the guy who could say it. There was nobody who could do all the things that I could do or not do the things. Paul was saying that I never went with how my mom used to say, don't go or don't cuss or chew or go with girls who do. Paul, he was like, I never cussed or chewed and I never went with girls who do. So, I mean, he was said, I am the cream of the crop. I've done everything. So Saul's religion had led him to be very confident. I would even say it had led him to have faith in his own moral record. He was very confident. Paul had faith in his ethnic, racial, and national inheritance in his background. Paul was very, very confident in his knowledge of the Bible, of his knowledge of the things. He was very confident in his education and in his intelligence about what truth was. But like all religions, all of them, that run on performance, it led to Paul's feelings of superiority. He felt like he was better than everybody else. Saul's, look, any religion, guys, that teaches us that, if, that God will accept you if you just follow all the rules and if you just do all the things or you don't do all those things, what happens is, is that when you actually think you're doing that, everybody else who can't, won't, or just don't have the capacity that you have, you start to feel superior to them. You start to feel like you're a little bit better than them. You start to feel like, why can't they get it together? Why can't they just be like me? And that superiority in all religions throughout human history has led to this feeling of we're superior and we need to separate from them. Then that leads to we need to oppose them. And that leads to we need to just disrespect them. Which leads to we need to oppress them. Which ultimately leads to we need to incur violence against them. And that's where Paul was. He had gotten to the place that Paul admits this, by the way, later on in life in 1 Timothy. He says, I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, I was an insolent or violent opponent of the gospel. And so, I say all this to say to you, <laughs> I'll give you all that background for Saul, that I want you to understand that when Luke writes that Saul was going on his way, he's not just telling you that Saul was on I-40 going to Damascus. He's not giving you the geographical location of where Saul was. He is telling you that Saul had chosen to go his own way. He's going his way. He could have said he's on the way, on a path, on a road. He says that Saul has chosen to go on his way to Damascus. You see, guys, Saul had rejected the teaching of his teacher, Gamaliel, his teacher, the guy who was well respected. This is what he says about what to do with Christians. In Acts chapter 5, you encounter this, Gamaliel, Paul's teacher, the one he sat at the feet at, the one that he learned from, it says, but a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all people, stood up and gave orders to put the men, that's Peter and John, they had been preaching, they arrested them, they were like, don't you do this anymore, and here's what his advice was, he says, uh, he says sit them outside for a little while, and he stands up and he says, men of Israel, take care what you do about these men. And in this present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will, or, but if, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. That's what his teacher tells. And there's no doubt about it that Paul would have been there to hear this. Paul was in the room when Gamaliel says this. In fact, Paul might have been sitting under his feet listening to it, but Paul rejects it because he finds himself opposing God in chapter 9, right? Paul, Paul had rejected the gospel. He had heard the gospel preached. 
Stephen had preached a wonderful, beautiful message in chapter 8, right? That Paul was there to listen to. He had heard this presentation of this is what God had said. This is what God had wanted to do with you. You guys had rejected God. He brought the Messiah to you and you killed him. But this Jesus has risen from the dead and you can still have put your faith and trust. Paul had heard that, preached from Stephen, and he rejected it. Paul had also denied the resurrection. He denied it. He had access to eyewitness accounts. He had access to the apostles. He had access to the disciples. He had probably seen or heard tales firsthand of Jesus' appearing, and he had denied all of this. Paul had found himself, Saul had found himself opposing God. And I find this amazing. Saul didn't know God. Listen to this. He was sent to Jerusalem to learn about who? Or learn about what? In all of his study, in all of his copying of the scripture, in all of his religious performance, in all of his prayers, Saul doesn't know God. Because in Acts chapter 9, when he encounters Jesus, he asks him the question, Who are you, Lord? Doesn't that sound absurd? That someone who had spent their lives, at least since they were 14 years old, Supposed to be learning about God. They didn't even know him. Could that be true in this room? Could that be true in this room that we've grown up and that we've studied and we know all that we know and we've been taught and we've had some wonderful preachers and we've come to church every single Sunday and every single Wednesday night and we don't cuss or chew and we don't go with girls who do and we don't know God. And if that is the case today, then my prayer, my pleading is that your way will encounter the way in this room. Saul, he was going his way because his star was on the rise. He had a good future ahead of him. He was headstrong and he was self-willed and he was stubborn. He was unwilling to change his course in the attempts of others to persuade him otherwise from the gospel being preached to him and he was stubborn and he went his own way. As my mama would say, Saul was set in his ways. And you weren't going to get him out of them. Paul, Saul, <laughs> he had went the way that seemed right to a man. But his way's not the way, is it? But his way's going to encounter it. It's going to be a collision with them. See, on the road, it says when he's on the road, the synagogue's going to Damascus. He is looking for people who belong to the way. Well, this word, this phrase, this term, the way, is used several times in the New Testament, particularly in Acts, to describe Believers of Jesus, people who were Christians, people who were followers of the way. It was a derogatory, sarcastic term that they used, probably because of the teachings. I'm sure that the early disciples had heard that Jesus had taught them that he was, I am the way, the, you can fill in the blanks here, the truth, the, no one comes to the Father except through me. He had taught that, and so they were teaching that this was the way. And this was a pluralistic society, guys. This was a society where there was a little God for everything, right? Little G, there was a God for if you needed a God for fertility, if you needed a God for sports. No joke, there was a God for sports, you know. I don't, uh, there was a God for everything. Uh, you, if you just prayed to it and you could find you a God, right? So this is a pluralistic society. And people made fun of it. It even offended some of them, I'm sure, in this society that they would say, my goodness, those poor little ignorant people, they really believe that that's the way. Because that was the claim then, and I believe that's the claim now, isn't it? That we're either ignorant, those of us who are believers in Jesus, we are either ignorant or we're arrogant to believe such a claim. Ignorance, if you, if you, if you, if you know and you study your, uh, uh, the, the New Testament, those who, the early believers of Jesus, were the, 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 they were fishermen. They were women. They were um, of the poor the outcasts of society, the marginalized, those who were uneducated, who didn't have access to education. So they were considered those poor little ignorant people. And it was for them, you know, like, I can't believe that they're, but when Paul comes, I mean, this is the educated guy, so they got to make, they got to start questioning stuff. But when they interviewed Peter and John, they actually said, hey, these were, we, we thought they were uneducated men, but then they realized that they had been with Jesus, right? 
They're poor, it's, those, it, it's those poor, unenlightened people. It's those people who have been fooled or duped into believing such a fairy tale. Does that sound familiar to the day that we're in? Probably some of the things that you faced in your life and encounters with others who are non-believers. There's a popular American philosopher. He, matter of fact, he's the, one of the most sought after for the last two decades and one of the most sought after philosophers on college campuses in the United States and around the world. His name's Sam Harris. He's a neuroscientist and he goes around and he speaks against religion and anything that would have to do with morals coming from an objective truth or something that would come from the Bible. Particularly, he is antagonistic and out to get anyone who's a Christian. And particularly, he's pushing back against Jesus Christ himself. Sam Harris said in a, in a, in a, he was doing a, I mean, a, a speaking engagement. There's thousands of people there, and I watched it. And at the end of it, when he says this quote that I'm going to share with you, the place erupted into a standing ovation, emotional standing ovation in the front. And here's what he says. He says, because this is what, I want you to understand this and here, this is what's being taught. This is the way today. And he says, the world must have a domain of expertise, a group of people who have moral genius and talent. If, they are, or if there are experts in the area of physics, then why not have experts in morality and ethics? When talking about facts of morality, certain opinions must be excluded. Translate that. Certain opinions are ours. Certain opinions about that are Jesus. Anything that Jesus would say, this is right and this is wrong. Anything that Jesus would say, this is the way. Religious people, he is saying, are ignorant and they only the enlightened people need to be around the table to say what the way is in this world. But I have a fear when I read this of thinking, what does exclude mean? For Paul, it meant from going to excluding to executing to stamp them out because they're less than we are. They're ignorant. The way was seen then and it is now seen. If we believe in that, we're arrogant. How dare you? How can you tell me? How do you really think that you're better than me? Right? Have you ever heard that? Do you really believe? Who do you think you are? Do you really believe that you're the only ones that are going to heaven? And here's what I always say when I have those conversations. Have you asked that of Jesus? Have you asked that of Jesus? Because ask Jesus who he says he is. Do you, who do you think you are? What would Jesus say? I had a coach one time tell me that it's not arrogant if you can back it up, boy. Right? So when you ask Jesus this, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John chapter 11, when you ask Jesus these questions, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Matthew chapter 7, Jesus teaches and he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. I want you to understand this, believers in Jesus, followers of Christ, followers of the way. We don't follow a teaching. We follow the teacher. We are not saved by a system of beliefs. We are saved by a Savior that we believe in. Right? And you say this to Jesus, and he's not arrogant about it because they, he's like my coach. Back it up, right? They did that with Jesus. Jesus says, I'm God in flesh. And they said, back it up. And he would say, okay, blind man, come here. Leper, come here. Lame person, come here. And they would say, oh, that's not him. That's, you're doing that by the power of Satan, right? By Beelzebub, you're doing that. And he said, okay, I tell you, I'll do the ultimate proof of who I, that I am who I say I am, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Kill me, and in three days later, I will raise myself from the dead. And what are you going to do about that? And that's what he does. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And guys, believers in Jesus, hear me. This should never, I'll be ignorant to the day I die. I don't care how many doctorates or how many degrees I can hang on my wall. I will be ignorant of everything except for Jesus. But I'll never be arrogant. I pray. I pray that we will not be arrogant. I pray that, that that won't happen in our hearts because we can't be arrogant when we know that we've done nothing to save ourselves. We can't be arrogant when it's not that we followed the teaching, that it's just the teacher. 
We can't be arrogant when we know it's not the system that we follow and the belief in. It's not the coming to church or knowing all of this. It's not that. It is him who saves us. J.D. Greer says this about it. He says, really believing the gospel changes the whole shape of your life. You're not arrogant because you realize that you are not accepted because of your good works and because you figured out truth, because you were smarter than everyone else. God has saved you. That humbles you. It makes you gracious, a forgiving person, because that is what God has been to you. You want to know why Paul was the greatest evangelist the world's ever known? Because he got that humility. On the road to Damascus that day, his way had a collision with the way. And he knew that it was only Jesus that saves him. When our way collides with the way, things start to change. Like Saul, the world has chosen to reject Jesus and we all want to go our way. That's all other religions are, guys. Every other religion on the planet is only some system to say, I want to make a way to God. Whether it's Siddhartha Gautama with uh, Buddhism, whether it's Confucius, whether it is Muhammad and Islam, whether it is Sam Harris and the moral relativists or the cultural relativists, all it is is a system to say, I want to make me a way to make God happy and to please God. All of them, all of them lead to exclusion. The Bible teaches us, though, that this would happen. So smart. God's so smart to show us. In 2 Peter, he writes, Many will follow their deprived conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. Proverbs 14.1. My mom used to tell me this quote all the time. Proverbs 14.1. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to what? Death. You ever hear this, right? This is what the culture teaches us. This is the way of the day. Follow your heart. Whatever's in your heart, you do. Don't do that. Your heart is deceitfully wicked. Jeremiah, 20, uh, or Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Do not follow your heart unless you have given your heart to Jesus and there has been this miraculous spiritual heart transplant that has taken place, Right? People say that we're arrogant to believe this because it excludes all others. But I think that the gospel, as Tim Keller would say here, he says the gospel is an exclusive truth, but it is the most exclusive truth in the world. You see, guys, every other religion teaches this. And I told you, look, if God were on a mountain, okay, if God were on a mountain, that if you will just do, if you'll just follow these, this, this path, if you'll just do these things, if you'll just hurt these people or help these people, whatever it is, if you just do this, then you'll keep making God happy and you'll keep climbing up that mountain. And one day, either in this life or the next one, you're going to get to him eventually. You'll get to the state with him and then you'll get to be with him, right? That's all they teach that. Jesus comes and says, that's nonsense. That's fairy tale. The only way is that God came to you. God came off of the mountain and came down to you and then went on a mountain, died for your sins so that you could be carried to God through Jesus. That's the gospel. That's the truth. And that's not exclusive. That includes all. Jesus taught us in John 3, 16, for God so loved the what? The, those who could do it, he, for God so loved the good looking, for God so loved the athletic, for God so loved the people who could follow all the It does not say that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that, that who, I love how the King Jimmy says it, so whosoever, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's not exclusion. That's inclusion. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. That's not exclusion. In fact, those who say that we are ignorant and arrogant for believing in this, I would say it's an ignorance of the gospel, of the true gospel, and an arrogance on our own parts of wanting to create our own ways. And Jesus isn't excluding anybody. We're excluding him. So what must happen? Our way 
must have a a collision course with the way. I struggled over that word for weeks now. For weeks I've been looking at this. Should I say our way needs to have an intersection with the way? Or our way needs to have like a yield sign? (laughs) We need to yield. This sounds good. It's biblical. Biblical? Biblical. I just said biblical. (laughs) Anyway, that's biblical. Um, but you know, there's, there needs to be this intersection and we can yield and submit. Or there needs, there's a stop sign. No, there needs to be a collision. A collision with your way and the way. You need to die. My way needs to die. Paul did not decide to change his behavior on the road to Damascus. He didn't decide to let Jesus turn over a new leaf in his life on the road to Damascus. Paul didn't decide that he needed to be transformed even on the road to Damascus. Paul was converted on the road to to Damascus. It was a collision course that left him blind. Oh, blessed blindness. That we today would come in here with our ways and let them collide with the way and it leave us blind. And at the end, we're just grappling and groping and saying, where are you, Lord Jesus needs to intersect and collide with every area of our lives. Now, many of you guys may be thinking, well, this is a message for those who are lost. But it's not only for the sinner, but this is for the backslidden saint as well. Husbands, eyeball me. Eyeball me. I say it all the time to my staff, eyeball me. We're going to get serious now, right? Okay, eyeball me. Is there any areas, husbands, in your lives where you have decided, I'm going to do this my way? I'm going to be the kind of husband that I want to be that benefits me, that's better for me, right? Wives, what about you? Has there been areas in your life, are there areas in your life where you've said, I'm going to be the kind of wife I need to be for me? Parents, what about you? Have there been some moments in your lives where you said, you know what, I'm going to raise my kids the way I want to raise my kids because it's better for me. I've been, man, studying this, convicted crazy about this, about how it just benefits me some days to just do this my way, right? To this my way instead of engage and do what I'm supposed to be as a parent and as a father, right? What about anyone in here, if you decided to, look, I'm going to do, my finances are mine and I will do them my way. My way. I'll spend the way I want to spend and do what I'm, none of that's going to, but what about your time? You said, I'm going to take my time. What about, what about your sexuality? I'm going to do this my way and what feels good for me instead of God's way. What about with your talents and your careers? I'm going to do this because I'm going to pursue this my way. You see how this intersects today, guys? How this is a message for everyone in this room. We cannot let our ways continue we have to let the way intersect. God knew this, though, by the way, if you're sitting there and you uh, pray that God's convicting you. But God knew that this would happen a long, long, long time ago. He knew you would go your way. He knew it. Isaiah 53. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. How many of you could testify going your own way doesn't work out too well, right? I told him in the first service I was going to do a little Russian thing, you know, because I wanted everything. (laughs) It's a little cheerleading thing there. Yes, we knew, God knew you would choose your own way. And if that were the end of this verse, we would stand all of us condemned. It would be as when Paul, I mean, when Jesus encounters Saul and he looks at him and he says, Who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. And don't read anymore, because I'm going to tell you what my response would be if I was Jesus. And you killed my friend and follower, Stephen, and now you're going to pay. That's what I would say. That would be my response. But there's a but. And in this verse here, written... 4,000 years ago, Isaiah says, they've all turned their own way, but he says, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's a way, his way. It's always been the way. 
the way of grace, the way of Jesus, we have the glorious, wonderful opportunity of everyone in here that you said, I've been going my way as a husband, as a dad, as a wife, as a parent, as a kid, as a student, as a whatever. We all have the glorious opportunity today to repent to turn from our way and turn to the way. Not a way of this world, not a way that anyone else would teach us, but we have the wonderful opportunity to turn to the way. But rise, he says, and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. I love this. Look, I don't know what your background is, but I'm going to pause a little bit and do something different than I did in the first service, but I went my way. And it turned out lousy. For not only me, but for a whole bunch of people. I was a mean somebody. And I lied and I told just all sorts of things for my own advantage so that it would benefit my way. Especially someone who knew God, not just about him. And I still rejected him. And I still turned and went my way. And I know there's a lot of college students in here, and I just just to pause to speak to you and to talk to you individually. This is the time in my life when I really chose my way. Please, I beg you, with everything that God has in me, as if he's pleading through me to you, stop going your way. Go his way. Find someone who will show you his way. Because your way leads to destruction, not only for you, but for a lot of people in your path. And it doesn't glorify God. And if you have gone your way in here, I want to tell you that God can use you. See, whether you grew up poor, no silver spoon, no well-connected family, could barely read when you got to college, had a 1.7 GPA. 1.7 is what I just said. Fell seven out of eight classes. Not the most educated, smartest person in the world. Always in trouble. He can still use you. Whether you're stubborn, unwilling to change. Oh, aren't you glad Paul was stubborn? Aren't you glad that God took everything that he was from his educational background to his stubbornness and used it to get the gospel where it was not. Well, what about you? What about us? What will he do if we allow today that collision to happen and our ways get just collided with his way, the way? Maybe you came in here today and you've been really confident in your own moral record. You've been to church your entire life. Maybe you're very confident in your performance of religion. You're very confident in your knowledge of the Bible. I'm sure there's many of you in here could tell me a thing or two when it comes to that. But if that's all you know and you don't know Him, you're lost. And you need to find God. Let's pray. God, pray that every eye in here would be closed and every head would just bow and God that I'm uh, I believe that you're doing a work in this room Lord in hearts if we've been prideful you're humbling us if we've been ignorant about things you're educating us if we thought we've too been too educated you're making us ignorant God, you're letting us know that the one thing that we should boast of and brag about is your son Jesus and only him. I pray, Lord, for everyone in here that has been going their own way, whether it's for salvation, they have came in here and they've believed that their belief system, following the teaching, doing everything just right, whatever right is to them, that you would collide with that today and say, you must have me. No one gets to the Father 
No one gets to heaven except through me. I'll die for you. And God, I pray for the husband and the wife or the child, the student, anyone in here, God, whatever area of their life, they've been going their way. That today you would just speak to them and say, it's time to stop. And as every head's bowed and eyes closed, I want just this to happen in the room. If you have been going on your way in any area of your life, I want you to slip up your hand and raise it up there. Just in an acknowledgement of saying, I've been going my way. Father, you see every hand and every heart. And God, I pray for not behavior modification today, but I pray for conversion of the heart. Conversion of our very lives, Lord, and souls for your glory. Do what you need to do with today, God. From here and as we leave, help us, Lord, to go out into a world not seen as a bunch of arrogant people who think they've got it together, but a bunch of people who brag on the one who did. A bunch of people who know that there is no good in us, but there is good in Christ our Savior. And proclaim that. We love you, Lord. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.